Policy shapers and lawmakers call for more participation of women and youth in politics. And former President Goodluck Jonathan advocates for the independence of electoral bodies in Africa. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cohn. As 2023 approaches, the challenge before the Nigerian electorate is not just the choice of a good candidate, but a candidate that reflects and understands true democracy and will also be able to accommodate the youth, women and society at large. In February of 2021, uh, Anoyo state lawmaker in the House of Representatives, Tolulokwe Akonde, called on leaders of political parties to make provisions for more women and youth participation in politics. But the question is, how ready are we to reposition our polity? Well, joining us to discuss this is broadcast journalist Gabriela Anyamu. Uh, she's an also a public affairs analyst, Sonny Madika, and former founder, policy shapers, Ebenezer Wikina. Thank you very much, gentlemen and lady, for joining us. Thank you for having me, Marianne. Great. So I'm going to start Thank with you, you um, Dr. Madika, because um, many have been calling for, um, you know, um, captains of industries, um, the elites, um, those who are more famous even than politicians to get into the ring and uh, also be part of, you know, the political reshaping of Nigeria. But unfortunately, we keep hearing that age-long story of, oh, politics is a dirty game. But we see these captains of industries and people who have proven track records in leading companies or um, parastatals um, saying that we see them gather together, you know, rallying around behind the career politicians, throwing their supports behind them, but they never really want to sh come forward to run for office. So again, the people who are calling for these elites to run for office, could it be that maybe there's something in those elites that we see that is way better than the people they support who are career politicians who uh, at some point may have let us down? Yeah, you started it uh, well, because uh, politics is a career, uh, whether you like it or not. And um, when you see people like that good uh, dollar supporting somebody, uh, it's part of the politics interest. Uh, police is not for everybody anyway, but uh, coming to the topic we're talking about, in terms of women participation, the allies participation, uh, we have a problem. And the problem stems from the constitution and, of course, uh, the money involved. Some guys that are good, uh, have that integrity, uh, could be measured in principle and value. Uh, the, the, the money uh, aspect of it is what is driving a lot of people out of uh, politics. Uh, and that is not well uh, good in us because we are already losing a lot. Uh, those who are supposed to be career politics are not there. What we have today are people who were fortunate that in 1999, when politics came on board, they were able to tap from what was the debris in 1993. Because after 1993, a lot of those who ought to be in politics lost hope after the annulment. So, so when 1999 came on board, a lot of those career politicians didn't come on board. It was people who took risk uh, that came on board. And we are looking at this uh, scenario as something that will fizzle out through 1999, within short time, the military will take over. But we are seeing that we are having, we are having uh, 20 years plus. So now it's now done in everybody that look, that risk would have been taken then. But people didn't take that risk. And unfortunately, those people that hijack that uh, uh, political uh, arena sat down to now manipulate the entrance point. The entrance point is a political manifesto. So you can see that before you even buy for ordinary uh, uh, councillorship, you have to have some money, uh, which ought not to be. 
And that is why some people are not going into politics, because it has been bastardized. Uh, politics is no more for service. It's not for, it has now become selfish uh, idea by few individuals. Uh, politics is supposed to be where people that want to serve know that they are serving humanity. It's not for themselves. But unfortunately, you see, in Nigeria today, we have politics that is for me, my family, my friends. So it's no more for the people. So this is the reason why some people are not going in. Then the other one is the security aspect of it. You saw what is happening in Anambra today. Who will go to input politics? Who is sent? So who, some people who are sent cannot go into politics because it's becoming uh, a, a winner it takes all. It's becoming a butchering arena. Uh, people are no more, uh, the sacredness of human life is no more there. So but, everybody but, but, is but, 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 with everything as if we're in a jungle. We're, so we're complaining about why. all of these things. How do we sanitize the system if we're all going to stay out there and say, well, we can't, don't dirty, we can't get ourselves dirty. This is not for us. Like you have said, oh, it's not for people who are sane. But how can we make the atmosphere or that arena, as you put it, sane if we, the so-called sane people, do not dare, like you said earlier on, to also take that risk? Yeah, you can only take a risk where you have a platform that is for everybody. The platform is already deformed. The platform where you can easily enter into politics is not for everybody. Like I just said, look at uh, the manifestos of all the parties. You discover before you galvanize it, before even engaging, uh, you expect them to have a godfather, you expect them to have a certain amount of money. Uh, so people are not looking at you the integrity of the participant or the candidate. People are looking at what are you bringing on the table, which is not ought to be, because people are coming to serve. But if you see the platform, the foundation of this politics, like I said, has been distorted, because the, 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 the issue about bringing policies that whereby people can enter freely is not there. We, have, we don't have uh, uh, independent candidates in this uh, country. Look at even the uh, electoral uh, reform bill that was passed. You, you can see that there are still problems there. People are saying, look, this must be done in terms of transmitting um, results. And people are saying, no, uh, uh, you know, we are looking at not too young to run. Yeah, it's good. But that too, not too young to run. What are the basis? Because a young man who has no money cannot venture into the Nigerian politics arena today. So the, 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 the bottom line, let me just say is that we need to go back to the drawing board and look at our constitution and see how we can give room for everybody to participate. But for now, the politics in Nigeria is an enclosed entity. That if you want to enter, there are things, conditions that some of us cannot, you know, um, you know, kind of allow ourselves to be part of it. So that is the issue. If there's open open field, if everybody can participate, if people are coming to serve because they want to serve, not because of uh, have to belong to certain society, I have to belong to certain person. Somebody must mentor me in terms of money back that will accelerate my movement into that. Somebody must say, nominate me. So you see, politics is not uh, what, okay. why for uh, certain people I call the same individuals. Let me come to Ebenezer. Ebenezer, you obviously founded Policy Shapers because you wanted to, of course, change the mindsets of the people, who, young people who are co coming up uh, and see yeah. how they can also infiltrate the system. Uh, but the youth and women are mostly the cake for the conversation tonight. How do you even begin to tell or sell the idea of being a policy shaper or even getting involved in any form of policy uh, making or politics in its entirety to a young person who already has seen the picture that's been painted by Dr. Maduka? Yes, I mean, Dr. Maduka raises a very good point, and truly, what what he's saying is the is the is the sad truth. Um, it's a it's a really crazy arena out there. However, I think that that is even the reason why the same people in quotes need to even go in there. I mean, last year I joined the political party in Nigeria last year, and sometime last year we also founded the Policy Shapers platform, and um, we didn't think that we would get as much um, acceptance as we, as, we, as we got. I mean, our community now has over 270 young people who are constantly engaged in policy conversation, whether it's on bills in Nigeria, 
um, policies all across all across the world. I mean, we we've taken part in three global policy hackathons at Stanford and MIT, just trying to see how we can even just pack the interest. I think that is where it usually starts. It's mostly about interest, and at at some point, I think the interest of so many people who I think represent the best of Nigeria was lost at the point where, as, as Dr. Maduka mentioned, the point where certain people got in and took hold of that, of that, of that space, right? So I think that early, early adoption is what is going to be very key. There's nothing wrong to, um, to, 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 to begin teaching political education, I mean, I know, I know we learn civic studies and stuff, but it's mostly just theory. But there's nothing wrong with teaching people to actually become engaged in the civic space from secondary schools, really. They don't need to even get to universities. From primary schools, secondary schools, need to know about parties, etc. I mean, I'm, I'm imagining that if I got into a political party, I mean, I'm, I'm 28 years now. If I got into a political party about five years ago, what I would have learned over time, I would definitely be way better than where I am now, starting, you know, from scratch, learning about the rudiments, you know, understanding how members do different, different things and learning about inter-party inter inter -party politics. Mm -hmm. So I think that is, is interest. And we, we do have a huge role to play to stimulate the interest in young people very, very early on. And although everything that Dr. Maduka has painted is true, I think we still need to go in there because... If, if we don't, like, I mean, I was discussing with a couple of friends on Twitter a few days ago. If we don't go in there, when would we actually go in there? I mean, we say, oh, things are bad, things are, things are dirty. But that is also, often because people who had taken over the space have been able to dominate it for, what, 15, 16 years. So imagine if we need another 15 years to change the narrative. If we don't go in now, when are we going to go in? Many throw around the, the statement or rather the coinage, the office of the um, citizen of the Federal Republic. We throw it around. But do we really know what that office entails? Do we know the power that comes with that office? Because that's another thing. We see a lot of young people. Now, let me just digress. The people who snatch ballot boxes, those who are engaged in banditry, those who are shooting up the place in Anambra, in Aba, um, these are mostly young people. My father, at his age, would not be doing that. It would, really, it would be ridiculous for him to be doing that, gun running and all of those things. It's the young people that are the ones that are being used, whether they're doing it for political parties or politicians or for all kinds of you know, strange reasons. It's young persons. So again, it, brings to, it calls to question how ready we are to take on the future. Because when it's pre-election season, we see these kinds of conversations come up. Oh, the youth needs to come and take their place. Women need to get involved in politics. But in reality, the young people seem not to understand how powerful they are. So where do we even start? I like what you're doing. And you're touching a few lives. But how many more young people are taking advantage of the situation to engage more young people, whether they be interested in politics or not, but in terms of the roles that they have to play in society because ultimately it affects us one way or the other. Oh, I think we lost him. Um, let me throw that question to um, Gabriela. Go ahead. So um, I, I think that it's a very interesting um, question because this is our reality. I kind of think that, you know, um, the norm of politics is a dirty game has sunk in so deep into our subconscious. And so with every generation after the other, we learn and hear people always say, oh, politics is a dirty game. And so we grow up as women and young people not wanting to engage in politics because we presume that politics is supposedly a dirty game for the adults. And I think that's a very wrong notion. I also think that's why we have become so complacent when it comes to politics. I mean, just like Dr. Magda mentioned earlier, how many people... How many Nigerian women and young people are card carrying members of a political parties? You would find the numbers to be very, very, very low. Think about the population of Nigeria, for instance. Women make 9% of that figure. Half of that percentage are, 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 are eligible to vote. How many of these women actually come out to cast their votes? How many women engage in conversations? bordering politics and you know governance and the economy how many young people today are interested in having such conversations think about for instance the president of nigeria muhammad buhari in the military regime think about when he started 
you know, involving in governance and leadership at a very young age. How many 25 year olds, for instance, do we have right now who are engaging stakeholders, who are asking questions, demanding accountability? We don't have all of that right now because we have grown so accustomed to the idea and the thinking that oh, politics is for the elderly people, is for the older people. Right now, I need to just focus on, you know, having a great time with my life. I mean, ought not to be so. I think that it's, we, we, need, we need a reorientation. We need to be able to, you know, um, create or spark a new level of consciousness to say, look, the Nigeria we so desire, the Nigeria we so anticipate to enjoy in the future lies on my shoulders as a Nigerian lies upon me as an individual first you know so it's beautiful that we have young people i will not deny the fact such as mr ebenezer Wikina, who is doing amazing right now but he can't do that all alone you know we need more young people taking the bull by the horn and realizing that look policy politics economy conversations about governance and leadership actually rests on our shoulders just like you mentioned earlier, these young people who go about, you know, working for, you know, the uh, uh, leaders who go about, you know, um, carrying out illegal, corrupt activities, especially when it regards to elections, they do that using the services of these young boys. If you know that your vote actually counts, you would not engage or sell it for a thousand naira or for a couple of thousands. But, but Gabriela, let me take you on there. We, it's, it's, it's easy for us, for you and I, who have had access to education, we've gone to great universities, we've got good jobs, uh, to sit on our high horses and say that, oh, if these people do not know the power of their votes, blah, blah, blah. But do we really look at the reason why these people are where they are? We've had leaders come and go who've promised to give good education, to give access to health care, and some of them grew up in the worst areas and really have nothing to hold on to. I remember when I spoke to Sheikh Gumi, he, he talked about the fact that there was poverty, um, there was, some of these people were abandoned by their governments, and, and this is their own way of getting back at government. I'm not in any way saying that what they're doing, especially the bandits, is great, but we fail to address, maybe we do fail to address, the reasons why we have these kinds of upsurges or why we have these non-state actors come to play. Can we just sit here on our high horses and point fingers and not uh, take into consideration what must have thrown these sets of people up? I think that's why we need the people who are already in power, of course, speaking about women now and the young people who are already in some level of leadership to take the bull by the horn. You're supposed to be at the top of the ladder. You are supposed to be able to pick others as you come up. Because like you mentioned, it's a valid problem. It's a challenge, poverty, illiteracy. You cannot go to, for instance, the rural areas right now and say, oh, your vote count. They don't even understand what you're saying. And for this message to get to the grassroots, it behoves on the people who are already in some, you know, in, participating in leadership at whatever level to take the bull by the horn and pick others as a climb up. We have some young people who are in their 40s, who are in their who are 45 year olds, who are either in the House of Assembly, who are, you know, in the Senate. We have people right now who are in some level of participation. What are they doing? We can't expect a miracle to happen. And all of a sudden we're seeing, you know, the numbers rising just because some miracle happened and everybody suddenly realized that, oh, I have the power. It will never happen. That is why we have to keep the conversations going, making the demand of the already existing leaders that we have, especially the young ones among them. So what are the young people doing in leadership? What are they doing? I want to go back. I think that because if we can make demand of these people who are in the Senate, who are in the House of Assembly, to involve, not just involve, engage foundationally, these other people in the rural and grassroots, then I think we're, we'll, we'll, we'll well be on our way to, to you know, a better engagement and participation in okay. politics. I want to go back to Dr. Madhukar now and still talking about, I remember I, I put it down because you talked about us revisiting our constitution and making it accommodate a lot of things. Um, you also make mention of the fact that, you know, the uh, Electoral Act bill, which is supposed to be signed into law, still has, you know, uh, some hiccups and Nigerians are still pushing and dragging for the National Assembly 
to agree to uh, the electronic, um, uh, wholesome electronic transfer of results or transmitting of results, and that's a case on its own. But let's not forget that these politicians that we're complaining of, these so-called corrupt or people who are not up to the task, are the people who occupy these offices. They're the people who occupy our National Assembly. And if we're asking for a change of sorts, can we be asking those people to make a change that would one way or the other cut off their arm or cut off their nose to spite their face? So how do we even go about it? Yeah, there's this uh, phrase I used to say. I say a bad government. A, gov go a bad government will always be de uh, defended by those who benefit from it. And that's exactly what I can use in summarizing what you asked. Uh, you know, like you said, who are those that are benefiting from being the highest paid legislator in the whole world? Uh, legislators. Uh, so if you look at it from that, you discover that what Gabriela said and, of course, Beniza said, they are in synchrony. Look at it this way. In Nigeria today, the Constitution uh, is telling you that there are things you must do for you to get into position. One of them is that you must have at least basic qualification. And today, today, the constitution has a dichotomy because even from all, I don't want to go deeper, even from the, the person who is doing us today, what qualification? But can this thing happen to what that request? No. So there's a the me. Secondly, there's something that uh, uh, Gabriela said about women participation. Women cannot participate because the men in politics do not regard women. Let me give you an instance. One of the legislators came one day to the house of uh, to the house, and all that he can boast of is to tell the house that he has four wives, and they they can obey him even if he tell them to go anywhere. This is the problem. And if you look at our tradition and our religion, many women cannot come out because some of them are not allowed except in the other room. So women enlightenment is very is important. Unfortunately, we don't have women advocates. Women advocates that can go and liberate these women that have been imprisoned by our men folk. But there, there, the there, are, there are a few of them. There are lots of you know women who are trying yeah, to shape, yeah, there are shape few of them, the mindsets they are not, of other women. They are not. They are not forceful enough. For instance, if they are if they are forceful enough, the women in Nigeria, if they are forceful enough, should uh, should go deeper to understand that girls' child marriage is evil. How can you marry somebody who's eight years, twelve years, to somebody who is a politician, and nobody talks about it? So you are not taking that person to court. But in your registration of uh, uh, our SIM card, you say it's only from age 18. But you don't see anything wrong for a woman who is 8 years, 12 years, 14 years to get married to a politician. So there's a dichotomy. You see, when you talk about nation, nationhood building, it's... Oh, I think that... Uh, it's not about patriotism. Okay. It's not about people who want to really see that it's not about us, it's about others, you know. But of course, fortunately, we don't have them. For the use you're talking about, we have use today. What are they doing? Are they not part of it? Like uh, Benita said, some of the use are the ones being used by these uh, recycled leaders. Uh, uh, look at it this way. Our use today, they wanted to do something. They wanted to revolutionize Nigeria. We started with NSARS. Who are those people who truncated NSARS? I, who are the people who were ahead to truncate the same use? We have basically, historically, we have used before uh, Dimeji Bankole, we have uh, Dogara, we have uh, Bukari, uh, um, Sakari, um, uh, Saraki. Uh, it? Saraki, we have um, we have other people, Osu Jokano, uh, Ken Namani, uh, all these are used. What Where impact used? did they, they bring I don't think they're used to ensure anymore. that some things? change for the betterment of every Nigerian. For today, if there's any use we are all clamoring for, a few of them, of course, everybody will talk about Nike today. Because he's standing. He's the only person one can look at. Look around you. Who is your mentor? I'm not giving you the cycle ones and the use. 
So there's no way you can point out which is the basis of every 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 government or every okay. nation development. There must be somebody that people will point out and say, this is somebody who is taking us to the air that I do. Unfortunately, Nigeria, no, for now. Okay, I don't know if Ebenezer is back, so this question is for you. Um, we're talking about all the problems, but I always yes. like to point to... Yes, I am. Yes, I, I always like to point to solutions. Um, 2023 is around the corner. The politicians are, you know, um, repositioning themselves. They are strategizing. Um, political parties are also yeah. strategizing. We're hearing that this person is moving to that party, you know, back and forth. What about us, the people? What do we do also to position ourselves so that we do not get carried by the same wind that carries us away every single time we gear up for elections? Yeah, I mean, the first and most important thing is to get registered. 71% um, of every new voter so far have been young people. And we are continuing, I mean, within policy shapers and even outside, we're trying to continue to see how we can make more young people register. Because it's only when you register that you can even have a chance to show and to choose someone, right? That's usually the first step. The second, the second step is usually during political season, Conversations usually come up about biases, there are a whole lot of things that come up to, to, to distract people. But in this current political season, we're trying to see how we use social media to force the conversation to be about issues, you know, the key development issues. Let us stop discussing about where the person is from, who you, what is what is wearing, etc. Let's begin to discuss, you know, what have you done before you even came here? What what's your what's your track? What's your track record? Most politicians just appear overnight, you know, and, and run for a particular position without showing that they've done a similar thing that they're promising. So let's begin to ask questions, you know, strong questions. And answers for me gave me a lot of hope. Sometime last year, just like almost every young person, I was beginning to think about, you know, how can I write this test or write this exam to travel out of the country? But answers as, as successful as, as it was or unsuccessful, as people would say, it showed that it's actually possible to actually rally around people and get people to unite on a common cause. You know, for the first time for me in Nigeria, I mean, our parents say it happened in their time. But for me, for the first time in my life, I, I saw that happen for my own generation. We're able to rally together. And so that shows that we do have some sort of inherent power that we can use to push good causes forward. We just need to be able to say we want to do it. We just need to say, let us actually do it. And once we have that agreement, I'm sure we can go forward. So. To summarize, I would say let us register and let us make sure that the conversations are pushed forward. I mean, I'm happy for people like Gabriella and for Plus TV that continues to push conversations about issues. And those are the things we need to discuss. Let's forget about all the other things that uh, take, us, take us away. Let's talk about the issues and the track. Record. All right. And final words, Gabriella, because uh, you're the lady, so we're going to be biased about it. Um, <laughs> like I said earlier on, it's, it's, it's the women folk that are, women are the ones who are called to, um, you know, they're like the shakers and the movers in political parties, but what positions do they hold? Treasurer or women leader? They hardly make it to party chairman or even vice chairman or even spokespersons. We hardly see them in those positions. So if you're asking women to be part of political parties, how many more women can they rally to support them? Because the boys will always be there for the boys. It's a boys club. How can the women also form a women's club within the boys club? You see, I, I think it's a really sad situation we found ourselves in in Nigeria. You know, it's as though we take two steps forward and five steps backward. You know, I remember a time in Nigeria where we had a female presidential candidate and we all know what happened. You know, not even her family showed up to vote or support her. You know, so it's a really sad situation away from just you know, um, um, reigniting that consciousness. I think that women in particular, especially my major concern is for women who are already in politics. I think that the book of the responsibility falls on their tables. They ought to rise to the occasion and pull these other women up. So yes, indeed, the men would obviously be gearing right now towards the next elections come, what, 2023. And none of these men would be considering the women, so the women obviously have been left to fend and fight for themselves. I don't think we're fighting. I don't think we're fighting hard enough. You know, so in, in, in closing, I'll just say that, you know, the women who are already in politics at whatever level 
ought to rise to the responsibility. What are they doing right now? How actively are they pursuing the cause for women? You would find that in Nigeria, the kind of politics we play, just like Dr. Madika said um, earlier on on the show, it, it, it's quite sad uh, because in other crimes, for instance, you would find women who are championing causes for more percentage of participation for women, for young people. Even some men also fight that cause. But here in Nigeria, we all know what politics is here. Either you're siphoning funds, you're enlarging your, your coast, or you're just about your own selfish interests. It ought not to be so. And this is just a glaring example and a show to see how deeply we have failed as a system, how terribly the system we're currently operating under is failing and is a complete mess. We need actively to change. And that change starts with us realizing that as women who are already in the local government council, in the Senate, House of Assembly, whatever level, you have a responsibility. And that responsibility is to push for more women like you to come into leadership. Then and only then we'll even have a flicker of hope and begin to ask other women to be card carrying members at the very least. Well, I want to say thank you, Gabriela Ayawa is a broadcast journalist. Uh, Dr. Sunny Maduka is a political analyst. And uh, Benisa Wekina is the founder of Policy Shapers. Thank you so much, lady and gentlemen, for this very interesting conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you for thank having you. me, Maria. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. When we return, former president, good luck, Jonathan Six, independence of African electoral bodies. Is it achievable in Nigeria? Stay with us.